All right, so for those of you who are guests and weren't here last week, we started a, a sermon series called Stewardship, and uh, we're going to continue that today. And last week, Pastor Mike talked about, does anyone remember? Talk. Pastor Mike talked about our tongue and how we talk, right? And he talked about how our talk as individuals can bring life or can bring death to someone, right? He talked about how out of the heart the, out of the, heart, the mouth will speak, right? So whatever's in our hearts, we are going to speak when we get ruffled or if something goes wrong in our life. We're going to speak what's coming out of our hearts, right? And, and then he talked about how we just have influence. Every single one of us here in, in person and everyone online, we all have influence where we're at, right? That's what Pastor Mike talked about. And for those who weren't with us, I'm just going to tell you what stewardship is and, and just a really simple explanation or definition. Ready? It's the responsibility to manage all the resources of life for the glory of God, acknowledging God as provider. Now, you guys could probably guess right that I took that out of the Christian dictionary, uh, the Christian dictionary, I took that out. But I'll say it again one more time. Stewardship's the responsibility to manage all the resources for the glory of God, acknowledging that he is a sole provider. So what we see is that when, when we recognize that everything we have on this earth, everything that we've been given is a gift created by God for us, we have to recognize and should begin to shift our mindset to thinking, Lord, how do you want me to steward this gift? When we realize and recognize that everything's a gift, when, when we realize that the way we talk, our tongue is a gift from God, when we realize that the treasures we have, maybe the finances that we've been given from God, when we recognize that's a gift, right? When we recognize that our, our talents, what we are talented in, is a gift from God, and when we recognize that time itself is a gift from God, we should naturally begin to ask the question, Lord God, how do you want me to steward what you've given to me? Let me break some questions down for you guys. So one way you could ask is, God, how do you want me to steward my talk? If you weren't with us last week, I encourage you to go onto our website and check out Pastor Mike's message because it was an amazing message on how we speak. But we should ask, Lord, how do you want me to steward my talk? We should begin to ask, Lord, how do you want me to steward the talents you've given me? The giftings that you've given me, how do you want me to steward that? Lord, how do you want me to steward my treasures? How do you want me to steward my money? We should ask, Lord, how do you want me to steward my time? And here's the thing about time. I believe with all my heart, with all my heart, I believe that the topic we're going to talk about today is the most important about stewarding and stewardship in this series. And no, it's not because I'm the one speaking about it. That's not why I think it's the most important. I believe time is the most important because what we spend our time on is who we will become. Well, let me say it another way. Who we spend our time with is who we will become. And for us who are gathered here as believers, and maybe there's some of you here today or some of you watching online that are skeptical of who Jesus is. Maybe you're not fully all in on, on Christianity. If that's you, we can talk about that later. But for those of us in here as believers, how does God want us to steward the 24 hours in a day that he's given us? Time is something that we all have, right? We all have time. But unfortunately, sometimes, and for some of us in here, we, we feel like we don't have time, right? We feel like we're just constantly on the go. But here's the thing. God is so gracious that he gives every one of us 24 hours in a day. He doesn't say, hey, Pastor JJ, you get 36 hours a day, and, and Carol, you get 24. Well, Jamie, you can have 19 for today. He doesn't say that. He says, hey, all of you guys have 24 hours in a day, and I'm just going to let you do with it what you want. So I'm going to start this off with a test here today. Don't think too hard on these questions, okay? I see some of you guys are already sweating. The word test. All right. If you're someone who makes good decisions each day, how many hours in a day do you have? 
Yeah, there we go. Yeah, if you're someone who has, makes good decisions day after day, you have 24 hours. Now you know that answer, so let me ask another question. If you're someone who makes bad decisions each day, how many hours do you have in a day? 24. Awesome, you guys. A plus. We don't even have to round that one. We've all been given an equal amount of time. Whether you're someone who makes good decisions each and every day of your life, you have 24 hours a day. And if you're someone who's struggling and it seems like, man, I can't get out of my own way, I just keep messing up, you have 24 hours a day. Everyone has 24 hours a day. And so my one-liner that I have for us today is this. You can jot this one-liner down. Time, we all have it, but how do we prioritize it? Time. We all have it. How are we prioritizing it? I believe it's an important topic, especially today in America. And we're going to hit on three points that I believe the Lord gave me, and I'm, I'm excited for it. So let's pray, and then we're going to get into the message. Father God, we just thank you, Lord God. Lord, we adore you. We worship you. We love you. Father God, I thank you so much for the time this morning in worship, Lord God. I thank you that your spirit is here, Lord God. I pray that your word goes forth, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Father God, if there's any distractions in our lives right now, if there's anything that we're thinking of other than your word, may, may you just come upon that and just block that from that person. Lord God, as this message is spoken, Lord God, will you apply what we need to apply, apply on all of our own individual lives. Jesus, we love and adore you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, if we've all been given 24 hours a day, right, and we all know that we need to prioritize our time, how do we prioritize it, right? How do we prioritize the 24 hours that God has gifted us? The first thing I want us to, to recognize is that we have to recognize our days are numbered. If we want to steward our days, if we want to steward the 24 hours in a day, we have to recognize believers and non-believers, you have to recognize that your days are numbered. Another way of saying this is that life is fragile. The fragility of life, right? I want to start this off by prefacing for you guys. When we, when we talk about life and death, it can bring nerves, right? It's just like, oh my gosh, we're talking about death. But if you're born again and you're washed by the blood of Jesus, talking about life and death and talking about death especially should bring you peace. It should bring you comfort and excitement knowing that that your time here on this earth is limited. It's only a, a short period of the whole uh, glimpse of what God is doing. It's, it's short-lived, but that should bring you peace, knowing that you are going to be going home one day with our eternal Father, and where there's no pain, there's no issues, it's all love, joy, hope, peace. You're going to have a splendid time. So when I'm talking about this first point, that our days are numbered, rejoice in the Lord. Praise God. We want him to take us home, right? We, we want to be home with him where there's eternal peace. But it can bring this sense of like, oh my gosh, I, have, I don't have time already. And you're talking about death. Now I'm even more frantic. But our days are numbered. And we need to recognize as believers that you're here just for a little bit of time. You're here for just a short period of time. And if you don't recognize that you're here for a short period of time, you will not steward the time that God has given you. Ecclesiastes 3 says this, verse, or chapter 3, verse 1 through 2, for, for everything there's a season. So for all of us as, as human beings, we have a season that we're living right now, right? Everything there's a season and a time for every matter under heaven. So there's always a season and a time, but here's, here's what they say, a time to be born and a time to die. Let's just cut to the chase. There's a time to be born and there's a time to die. Man, that's just great news. But as someone, I just want to talk about someone in the Bible who learned the lesson of how our life is fragile. And for those who may not know, it's the man named Moses. And for those of you who don't know Moses, Moses was born in a time where uh, Egypt has taken over the Israelites. They're, they're, they've enslaved them and Pharaoh wanted to kill off uh, the Israelites. And so what Pharaoh does is he says every male child must be killed. Every, every male child must be killed. 
And so Moses, being an Israelite, was obviously a, a male. And so Pharaoh wanted him killed. And so Moses' mother put him in a basket and puts him in a river, right? For those who don't know the story, that's what I'm, what I'm talking about. And what happens is as, as Moses is floating down the river, Pharaoh's own daughter finds Moses. How ironic is that? The, the man who wants to kill all males, his daughter finds Moses, who's not an Egyptian. But she takes him in and she raises him. And as Moses is getting older, he sees that, that the Egyptians are hurting his fellow people, the Israelites. They're, they're hurting them, right? And so what happens? Moses kills them. Not all of them. He kills, he kills an Egyptian and he flees. He runs and he runs to Midian and there he settles and he, and he finds a priest, right? And he, he, uh, he marries the priest's daughter. But here's the thing about Moses. As we go along, Moses radically encounters God. Now, I don't know about you guys, if you don't know the story, but Moses finds God by a burning bush as he's just walking around, not really knowing what he's doing, and all of a sudden a bush just sets on fire and it says, Moses, I want to talk to you. I probably would have thought to myself, I'm going absolutely crazy. But what does Moses do? Moses goes to the bush and he, he receives what the Lord is saying and, and he struggles and he fights with the Lord because he doesn't know if he wants to go set free the, the, the Israelites. But God says, hey, I have a plan for you. And so God does all these amazing things through Moses. If you read the account in Genesis, he does amazing things in the Exodus. He does amazing things through Moses, things that I'm just like, I'm blown away here. Right? And what we would see in Moses' life is that though Moses was surrendered to God, though God did the miraculous through Moses' life, Moses was not perfect. See, we think that the people that God chooses in Scripture are these perfect beings, but they're not perfect. Everyone that God uses is a screw-up, but what Moses recognized was the fragility of life. Moses knew that his time on earth was limited, and if he didn't know that, he began to pray, Lord, teach me that my time is limited. We see it in Psalm 90 when Moses says, so teach us to number our days, that we may have a heart of wisdom. Man, Moses was surrendered to God so much that he said, Lord, teach me to number my days so that I can be wise in them. Moses got it. If you read Psalm 90, the rest of that book, it's a cry to the Lord. It's a, it's a longing for God. It's a prayer from Moses to the Most High. In the rest of the, that psalm, we see that Moses is, is coming to the Lord God and saying, man, we are sinners. We are wretched. We are broken people, Lord God. We are not doing the things that you've asked us to do, but will you teach us to number our days so that we can do that? Teach us to number our days so I can walk in wisdom. And then the rest of that psalm actually goes into God's grace. So Moses shows up and says, we're sinners, but then he recognizes God's grace because he realized the fragility of life and wanted to steward the time that God has given him. See, the word number in Psalm 90 comes from the Hebrew word manah. And what manah means is to divide into parts. It means to count. It means to reckon as. It means to remit. And can I just give you an example of what let me read that again for you guys. It means to divide into parts. Okay? It means to count, reckon with, and to remit, redeem. Teach me to redeem my time. Let me show you what it doesn't mean in the New Testament. James 4, 13 through 16 reads this. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow. Those of you who are saying, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. What, what James is showing here is for those of us who are planning ahead, for those of us who say, man, tomorrow I'm going to do something. Next year I'm planning this. I'm planning this five-year goal. I'm plan planning this 10-year goal. For those of you who are saying that, let me give you a new perspective about how fragile your life is. He goes on to say, um, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. 
We're limited. We're limited. God's not limited, but our minds are limited. We do not know what tomorrow will bring, yet we plan accordingly. We try to plan ahead. And what he's saying is, what is your life? For you are a mist. You're a mist that appears for a little time and vanishes. What's he saying? Why are you planning so far ahead when you don't even know if you're going to be here tomorrow? Why are you planning so far ahead? Why are you preparing to spend in a year? Why are you preparing to have retirement when you don't know what tomorrow will bring? He goes on to say, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills. If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting and evil. If the Lord wills, what he's saying is, man, fix your eyes on the present and say, Lord, if you have me going tomorrow, will you, will you enable me to do the will that you've called me to do? Don't look ahead. Don't plan ahead. I'm not saying that you can't set goals. My wife just got me a planner for a five-year goal, and I almost became really stressed out because I don't plan that far ahead. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, what do I do? Like, I was freaking out in my office. I'm not saying goals aren't bad. But what this word means, it, it means to not sit there and count the days of your life. I, I had a, my niece just turned uh, an age, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I don't remember how old she is. But my sister commented on her Facebook and said, I don't even know how you became 22 or 23. And I had to comment back. I said, well, that's simple. She was, she's lived 2,349 days of her life, which puts her at 22 years old. That's not what this word means. It doesn't mean, man, I'm 34 years old. Let me add up all the days that I've lived so I can say, ah, man, I'm 3,254 days old. That's not what this means. And it doesn't mean to sit and plan out our retirement. It doesn't mean to sit and plan out what's ahead. To, numbers, to number our days, take note of this, to number our days literally means to sit and meditate on the day the Lord has for you today. It means, man, I wake up and say, man, God, you created this day. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to live it to the fullest for your will. To sit and meditate and say, Lord, what is your desire for me today? What do you have for me today? That's what that number means. That's what mana means. And can I just be frank right now? This whole thing about time, I could just use one word and we can just worship the rest of the time. Or one phrase, which is, our time is to know God and to let God be known. And to number our days, we should say, Lord, who do you have in my life today? Who am I going to encounter that I can radically share the love of you, Jesus, with them? Moses got it. Give me wisdom and number my days. Church, I got to ask us, I, I really got to ask us, church, for all of us in this building as individuals and as a body of full life church, in our own individual lives and as a corporate body, what would happen if we began to think biblically about how God is the everlasting and we are not? What would happen if we began to believe that God is the beginning and the end and we are not, that, that he is the creator of all things and that we are not, that he is the one that, that determines tomorrow and we do not? That God is the one who determines when our lives end and we do not. What would happen in our own individual lives if we recognize that God is the sustainer, that God has all authority, that he is sovereign and he can take us home at any moment in time? What would happen with our days if we began to think that way? See, following Jesus, Christianity, Following Christ is not about us. Throw that away. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ has nothing to do with any of us in here. It has everything to do with Jesus Christ living a sinless life, living a perfect life, and taking our sin to the cross. It's about redemption. Yeah, that's about us because we're sinners, but it's about Jesus. And so if we begin to think about how our days are numbered and how we're born again, it should give us a desire to seek the lost. When we've been made whole by Jesus Christ, when his blood has washed over our body and how it's, it's cleansed our sin, 
we have an opportunity, just as Moses, Moses prayed, we have an opportunity to redeem the time that God has given us. You have an opportunity this morning to redeem the time God has given you. Praise God. That should be like, woo! I know it's kind of heavy. But it should redeem the time for us. We have an opportunity now as believers in Jesus Christ to say, Lord, teach me to number my days so that I can have godly wisdom. We have an opportunity to be joyful. I preached about that a little while ago. In the days that God has given to us. We have peace knowing that God has numbered our days. We should have peace knowing that God has numbered every single one of us. He knows when it's time for us to go home. What could happen if we began to think this way? What could happen in our lives if we began to think this way? I believe we become a church and individuals who will live on mission. I believe that when God removes the veil from your eyes and shows you that you have been gifted 24 hours a day and every day is a gift from God, we would begin to live on mission. So the first thing we need to do to steward our time is it begins when we recognize that our days are, our days are numbered. The second thing that I jotted down for us for stewarding our time is in order for us to steward it, we have to recognize that we've been created with a purpose. Some of you are going to struggle with that. Some of you are in the, you're down and out. You're, you might be struggling with depression. You might be struggling with anxiety. You might be stru struggling with stress. You might be struggling with the thoughts of God doesn't truly love you. And can I just say that's a lie from the enemy? We all here have been created for a purpose and, and with purpose. In the first book of the Bible, Genesis, we will see a picture of what purpose is. It's when God created everything, right? For those who don't know the Bible, I'm just going to show you a little bit. God created everything. God created light, and light had a purpose. God created the expanse, land. It has a purpose. He created water. It has a purpose, right? And as we continue to read what everything that God created and how it has a purpose, suddenly we see that God creates man. God creates man in his image. Purpose. God created us, and we all have purpose. But here's what happened was as the creation went, Adam and Eve were joined, right? God created woman out of man, out of Adam. And what happens is, um, I was going to say a joke, but it would have been a bad joke. I'm not going to say it. What happens is, they fall to the temptation of the enemy. The enemy attacks Eve and says, did God really say? And they eat of the one fruit that God says you couldn't do, right? And then knowledge was given to man and sin entered the world. That's the problem. What happens, why does that affect purpose? Because when that happened, purpose has been distorted. When sin entered the world, our purpose began to be distorted. The way we think of ourselves, the way we think of our lives, what we are here for has been distorted. So let me give you a definition of what purpose is. It's the reason, write this down if you're struggling with the reason you're here today. Purpose, the reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. Let me say it again. Purpose is the reason for which something is done, for something's created or for which something exists. Why is that definition important for us today? A God-sized hole can only be filled with God. A God-sized hole can only be filled with God. And when our purpose has been distorted, we naturally long for and try to find purpose. In a time of life when all we hear is, there's just not enough time in a day for me to do everything. In a time where we constantly speak the words or hear the words, I just don't know where my time goes. As a father, I've been saying that a lot. I don't know where my time goes. 
in a time where we constantly speak the words or hear the words, I'm going to try to find time, but I'm hard-pressed. When we begin to hear those things over and over in our lives, one thing has become true for us as individuals and as a nation, we have lost sight of purpose. So why am I telling you this? Because in order to steward our time, in order to take advantage of the 24 hours that God has given us, or a week, or a month, or a year, or seasons of life, in order to take advantage of that fully, you have to realize we as believers are created with a purpose. And that's good news. God delights in you. You're created for a purpose. That's good news. But here's the bad news. If you don't know your purpose is for God and in Christ Jesus, you're going to search for purpose of this world. One writer says it this way. Time is meant to be spent with the enjoyment of the blessings of God in himself. When we bring a utilitarian mindset or a mindset of performance and accomplishments, we begin to lose sight of all the important goal of knowing God and letting God be known. Purpose. When you find it in this world, you've lost your way. A God-sized hole can only be filled with God himself. In America, we've been conditioned to think the exact opposite, right? We believe that the things in this world, the things that we have today, the, the blessings of God, the giftings of God, everything that he's given us, we believe that that is our purpose. We believe that that's the reason we're created is to fulfill the, the giftings of what God has given us. So naturally what we do in our lives is we begin to carry a bag around. This is my wife, so if it breaks, I am sorry, honey. I got it for her for Christmas anyway, so it doesn't matter. This, let's, let's say that this is our life, okay? Let's say that this is our life. When we lose sight of purpose, what we naturally will do is begin to fill our lives with things of this world. So, for instance, man, I've lost my purpose, but I'm going to seek a job of power, I'm going to seek a job of authority, so I put that in my life. Man, I've lost purpose, so I have to figure out what my purpose is, so I'm going to be a diehard fan of Nebraska football. And if you stayed with them, woo maybe it is your purpose. No, I'm just kidding. But you, you begin to find a, a, a college, right? You, you support them, and you, you just, you're miserable when their seasons go bad. So if you're a Nebraska fan, that's like every, every year. <laughs> purpose, purpose. I'm going to find a job that pays me so much money. Man, $70,000 this year, I'm just going to take it, not even thinking of the ramifications of what's going to have in my schedule. But, man, I have an opportunity to make $90,000 next year. Purpose is in my money, right? How about purpose in academics? I don't know if college is for me, but I'm just going to go because I don't want people to think that I'm not educated. So I'm going to take out mass loans just to make it look like I'm educated because my purpose is in education, Right? Man, purpose. Man, my purpose is in talking with Jenny about this Netflix series. Man, I love this Netflix series. We just talk hours upon hours about it. So my purpose is now found in Netflix. Right? Oh, the big one. Smile, everyone. <laughs> Selfies, purpose. I find it in social media. But really what happens is, I start to stress about the perfect post. I start to stress about the perfect words. I start to stress about how many people like my pictures or like my my, uh, things I have to say. But it's my purpose. People recognize me. It's my purpose why I'm living. Social media. How about this one? We love this one. USA. (laughs) Our purpose is not in the United States of America. Let me break it down a little bit more for us. Our purpose is not found in Democratic or Republican uh, sides. But yet we've lost our way and we've put it in there. And so what naturally happens is we've filled our life full of things of this world. And we start to carry this around with us all over the place. It's like, man, I'm a a Republican. I'm good. That's my purpose. I'm a Democrat. I'm good. That's my purpose. Oh, man, Jenny, did you see that Netflix series? It's so good. And you start to just pile this up. And it's good at first. Man, it brings excitement at first because you're learning new things, you're watching new things, and then suddenly, pay attention. The weight hits you. 
and you wash it away. Suddenly, all the things of this world that you've placed in here, where you thought you found purpose, begins to crumble. Man, that person I voted for didn't really say he's going to do what he's going to do. Man, that Netflix show, that Netflix series did not end the way I wanted it to end. And I'm not really just vibing with everyone. Man, I'm only getting two likes. <laughs> like, am I not posting the right things? So you start to feel the weight of that. It's serious. Social media is serious. It has ramifications. Man, I have $160,000 of student loan debt. That may or may not have been my actual doctor. Just kidding. I have $160,000 of student loan debt that I don't know how I'm going to pay back. Wait, right? We already talked about how Nebraska's bad. <laughs> Money. Man, I'm making $90,000 a year, but guess what? I'm working eight to seven. My kids don't see me. My wife, my marriage is breaking down. But my purpose is in this job I can't let go. Power. Man, I may be brutal to people. I may do all these things, but, man, I have power. I have purpose. I can say what I want to say. You continuously carry that around, and the weight just continuously is just piled upon you because you found your purpose in the things of this world. And what God is saying is, is he's saying is if you find the time that I've given for you, that you have been created for a purpose, and that's to seek me and love me with all your heart, I promise I will show up, and that burden that you're carrying around with you will become light. Jesus says it. Jesus says, give it to me, and it will become light. But that's where we find our purpose today. In church, i got to tell you, we have to be very careful. All those things I mentioned are not bad in and of themselves. Watching Netflix isn't bad. Whatever political party you're on is not bad. Having a job is not bad. None of those are bad in and of themselves. When they become bad is when you find your purpose in them. You will become heavy laden. And what happens for us as individuals is we become to be filled with what? Anxiety. We become stressed. We become pressed. We become bitter. We become angry. And altogether we become emotionally un stable because we found our purpose in something other than Jesus Christ himself. And this is a scary thing about this cycle. If the Holy Spirit doesn't reveal it to you really fast, it is a repeating cycle. Now, I know I shouldn't buy this house, but man, I know my friends are, all of them are buying a house, so I'm just going to buy this house. Six months later, you don't even know how to make, the, make ends meet. So you're pressed there, and so what you naturally would do is, I have to buy, or I have to go out and get another job to provide for my family. And suddenly you have no marriage. You end in a divorce. It's a repeating cycle. When you find purpose in this life, you have to continuously add things to your life to feel like you have purpose. And I'm here to tell you guys today, right now, here, that you all have purpose in Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.16 says, For in him, that's Christ Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones of powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. You have purpose. Jeremiah 29.11 says, For I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You have purpose in Jesus Christ. Ecclesiastes 3, 11 says, He, that's God, has, has made everything beautiful in time. Everything he's made is beautiful. You are beautiful. I know some of you guys are kind of like, I'm not beautiful. Yes, you are. Also, he's put, uh, he, he's also put eternity into our hearts. Why is that important? Everything he's created is, is beautiful, but he's deliberately put eternity in your heart so that you can recognize that your purpose is not found in this world. It's found in the one true king, the everlasting Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let me just read this last one for you. Psalm 139.13. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. 
purpose. If we want to steward our time, Christians, the time that God has given us, 24 hours a day, you have to recognize that God has purposely and deliberately knitted you in your mother's womb. That he desires a relationship with you. That he wants to be intimate with you. That he wants to guide you and protect you and and love you and, and lead you. That he does want to give you the desires of your heart. You have to realize in order to steward our time, you have to realize and recognize you being created for a purpose. Because if you don't, if you don't realize that you're created with a purpose, you will not spend time with the one who created you. That's our purpose. To know God and to let him be known. I think we see a, I believe we see a perfect example of this in scripture. Someone you guys probably know really well if you know the Bible. But this is someone who knew their purpose and their will for life, and that's Jesus himself. Now let me clarify real fast before I get my license revoked from the assembly of God. Jesus was not created. Jesus always was. He is, he was, and he will be. That's Jesus. But he knew his purpose. He knew his will on this earth. We read it in Mark 1, 32 through 39. I don't know if I put it up there, but I'll read it for you. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick and oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. I mean, we got to realize the whole city, that's massive. I mean, the the people who were in cities back then in in Bible times, it's not just a, a town of 300 people. I mean, it's thousands. They're all at this door. And we read he healed many who were sick with various diseases and he cast many demons out and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him and rising very early in the morning while it was still dark he departed and went out to a desolate place and there he prayed and simon and those who were with him searched for him and they found him and said to him everyone's looking for you like jesus what are you doing we're looking for you just perform miracles what are you why are you by yourself You know Jesus' response? There's more people there. They're looking for Jesus. And his response? Let us go on to the next towns. I may preach there also. For that is why I came. And he went through Galilee preaching their synagogues and casting out demons. Why do I I read this passage? Because steward in our time begins when we recognize that we have to prioritize the heavenly. We have to prioritize the heavenly. In this passage, we read that Jesus was up all night, healing, casting out, doing all these miraculous signs he's caring for and loving and and, and doing all these things for the sick, the people that no one wanted to communicate with. He's doing that. And he's casting out the demons. It's a night of spiritual and mental exhaustion. I mean, think about this. You're up all night performing these miracles. God's performing them through you, right? He's God himself. He's doing all this. Physically, he's probably just drained. Emotionally, seeing all the hurt and the brokenness and the dirtiness and everything that's going on in the world that he created. It's coming to him. And spiritually, he's probably just drowned. He's up all night, and scholars, every scholar agrees that when it says that he got up early the next morning, that's somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m. He's up all night, and what do we read? He gets up and goes and seeks the Father. Everything he's doing, performing miracles, doing all this mass uh, exiting of demons, like casting them out, doing all this stuff, and what does he do the next day? He could have been famous. He could have done anything he wanted to there. He gets up and seeks the Father. This passage is showing us a glimpse, pay attention, 
It's showing us a glimpse of a heavenly mindset versus a worldly mindset. Let me break it down for you. Jesus was worried about prayer with the Father. Simon was worried about miracles. Jesus is worried about calling, purpose, his will in life. Simon's worried about needs. Weight. The weight of the world, the needs. So why is that important? Jesus knew that the needs of those who came later in that night or the morning did not constitute his call. Jesus knew that the people that came after all those healings did not constitute his call. That's not what he was here for. Have you ever thought why Jesus healed some, but he didn't heal all? Because he knew his purpose. He knew his will in his life. He knew that he had to come for one particular reason, and that was for the cross. So that we can be freed from the weight of this world, so that we can recognize that we have purpose so that we can recognize that we have to steward the very gift of time itself to get to know God and to let him be known, to to know Jesus and to let Jesus be known. I have to tell you guys something. As a church, something happens when you are deliberate about seeking Jesus Christ. Something happens in our lives when we say, Lord, I'm turning the TV off. Lord, I'm turning my phone off. Lord, I'm, I'm getting away from the radio. Lord, I'm, I'm spending time away from my family to seek you and you alone. Something happens in your heart. When you guys take the initiative and say, Lord, you've gifted me 24 hours, it's time. I'm serious about this now. I want to seek you. I want to love you. I want to know you. I need a touch from you. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to meditate on your scriptures. I'm going to seek you in prayer. I'm going to gather with the saints because I love them. Something happens when you spend time with God alone and only he can make that movement in your heart. But we, as Christians, have to recognize that we're created for a purpose and that we have to prioritize spending time alone with him. So why did I do this illustration? One, to show you the weight of the world. Because there's many of us in here who are jam-packed with schedules and God is on the back burner. And I will not be a pastor at this church that stands here and not say something to you guys, letting you guys know that you can stand before the Lord and he can say, I never knew you. If we are finding our way in the world and not with God, if we're placing him on the back burner, then what does that say about our heart? If we're not spending time with God, what does that say about our heart? That's one reason I showed you. The other reason is to show you that all those things in that basket will not amount to or even compare to the presence or the hope or the joy or the peace that you will receive when you're alone with Jesus Christ. Not one thing in that basket will give you peace, love, joy, or hope, but Jesus will. When we get alone with God, he looks down and he smiles. I think of my daughter, and when, when, when we spend time together on Mondays, it's my day off, and I get to spend alone time with Zoe and Gabby. Nothing other than spending time with my wife gives me more joy and peace than being with them. Because they're my daughters. You are sons and daughters of the living most high. And when you spend time and when you're deliberate and prioritize the heavenly, God says, now I'm going to move. I've always loved you, but I wanted to see how much you love me. 
So in conclusion, all I gotta say is, church, the, the, the excuses are running out. The excuses of placing God on the back burner, the excuses of not seeking Jesus with all your heart is running out of time. Why is stewarding time important? Because of this. We, lay, we live in the day of redemption. We live in the day of salvation. What I mean by that is Jesus could come at any moment. And I don't say that to scare you. I don't say that to, to make you feel pressed or anxiety or anything like that. But the truth is, is that when scripture is done being written, the day of salvation, when, when Jesus ascended, salvation, the day of, began. And we don't know when he will return. It wasn't just a few months ago that God really laid this, this on my heart. This, this sermon. I had to take a self inventory of where my time was going. Pretty easy with smartphones nowadays. And as a pastor, I'll let you know that you can get wrapped into it as easy as a mule. And so I looked at it. Because I kept saying, Lord, where's all my time going? I was spending over five hours a day on social media. But I, I was struggling to find a half an hour with God. My total use of my phone in a day was 12 hours. Think about that. That's practically all day. But I was finding a hard time spending time with God. God never moved away from me. I was slowly fading from him. I still am not questioning my salvation. I was praying and all that stuff, but I wasn't receiving the full gifting, the full blessing that God wanted to give me. So there's two things I just want to say for you guys today. I'm going to wrap it up and we're going to pray and then they're going to leave us. Time is of the essence. The thing about this message is I cannot cut it any more black and white. Time will expose your heart as an individual right now. The truth about time is that you either spend time with God or you don't. There's no way around it. What we prioritize will be at the top of our list. What we don't will be at the bottom. Where is Jesus on your list? If you're seeing that Jesus is coming in at 8, 9, 10 and not 1, 2, 3... Can I encourage you that today you can start over? That today you have hope to rearrange that, that list and put Jesus at the top. His mercy is new every morning. And so I don't mean this condemning. If, if, if take a self inventory of your heart, if Jesus is found on 8, 9, 10 in your list on a day's time, can I encourage you to shift it to one? Because I want all of us to be blessed by God. I want you to receive the full blessing of Jesus Christ, but that takes time with him. So as we leave, as she leaves this song, where does Jesus rank in your life? It's time to get serious. Father, we thank you so much, Lord God, for today. Father, I love you. I adore you. Lord God, I thank you that you're a God who will graciously expose where our hearts are at, how you will graciously show us that, hey, you're not spending the time that, that you want us to be with you, Lord God. But Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, will you guide us today at this very moment to reprioritize our lives. Lord God, to recognize that our days are numbered. Lord God, to recognize that you created us for a purpose. Lord God, to recognize that we need to prioritize our relationship with you. And Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus that when we do that, Lord God, will you just light a fire in our bellies, Lord God, so that we can go out and declare the goodness of you, Jesus Christ, the author and, and the one who gives us salvation. Father God, when, that, when we have to do that, when we want to do that, we have to spend time with you. May we start to do that today. We love you, Lord God. We adore you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.